good morning and welcome to Liberty's online worship. As the bell rings to call us to worship, we invite you to quiet yourself, to center yourself, to open yourself up to God's presence with you wherever you might be. Psalm 33 calls us to worship, saying, The Lord watches those who rely on his unfailing love. In him our hearts rejoice because we trust in his holy name. And so we come with joy because our God is a gracious father to us, because he's given himself to us in his son, Jesus Christ, and because by the power of the Holy Spirit, God is present with us right here and right now. So come and let's worship God.
And now let us join our hearts across the miles in prayer. God of grace and mercy, thank you for the gift of this day. The world has changed so much in these past two and a half weeks. So we come today asking to be filled with your amazing grace and tender mercies. Help us to discover your presence anew at every unexpected challenge that we encounter. Tune our hearts to the whispering of your still, small voice. As we undertake ordinary and unnoticed tasks, gift us with simple joy. And when life is overwhelming, call us to deep moments of your goodness and peace. For we ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, I want to share a special moment with all of our children out there. And so I'm Pastor Becky, and this morning, just in case we have friends watching who haven't met us before, I decided to wear a name tag. And my name tag says, hello, I'm Pastor Becky. We wear name tags so that people can tell, so that people know who we are, which reminds me of a story about all of the animals at the zoo. All of the animals decided to start wearing name tags so everybody would know what kind of animal they were. It was the giraffe's idea. And so the giraffe wore a name tag that said, hello, I'm a giraffe. And the lion wore a name tag that said, hello, I'm a lion. And the elephant wore a name tag that said, Hello, I'm an elephant. Well, the monkey, the monkey was a bit of a joker. He liked to play tricks. So one night, when everyone was sound asleep, the monkey went around and he changed all of the name tags. So the next morning, when the zoo opened, the giraffe was wearing a name tag that said, hello, I'm a zebra. And the lion was wearing a name tag that said, hello, I'm an alligator. And the elephant was wearing a name tag that said, hello, I'm a penguin. And the people who came laughed and laughed at the animals in the zoo. Well, when the animals figured out what had happened, they were angry with the monkey. But the monkey said, we don't need name tags. Just by looking at us, people can tell what kind of animal we are. And so then all the animals in the zoo took off their name tags. The story makes me wonder. Maybe we should wear a name tag that says, hello, I'm a Christian, so that everybody knows that we love the Lord. But on second thought, maybe that's not such a good idea. Maybe the monkey was right. Because just by watching us, people should be able to tell that we're Christians. Just by watching us, people should be able to tell that we love the Lord, even without name tags. Let's pray. Lord, help us to always act in such a way that everyone knows that we love you. Amen.
Well, welcome again to the webcast of Liberty's Sunday morning worship service. We're so glad that you're joining us, and I invite you to enter into a spirit of worship. Despite our physical separation, we are one in the bond of the Holy Spirit. Uh, since you are on the website, I encourage you after the service to check out lots of the new features that we're putting up there. First off, the Sunday worship service will be posted every Sunday at 10 o'clock. You know, I have to give credit to those of you who went through all the effort of arranging a global pandemic and a financial crisis, so we had to abandon our 9 and 11 o'clock services and come back to 10 o'clock. You win. <laughs> so every Sunday at 10, the service will be up. If on the main page, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see what is called the rotator, that piece that things goes whizzing by. Uh, we encourage you to click on the one that says Daily Inspiration. There you'll find both video and written uh, pieces by members of our staff. Words of encouragement, words of devotion to help inspire you. Also on that same rotator, you'll definitely want to click on the children's page. Uh, Don Parr, our children's director, has put a load of lessons and activities and learning things for our young people and families to take advantage of. Uh, you might want to check out the youth ministry page because not only are they doing great creative stuff, you know, they know how to do all this virtual stuff, so it's like falling off a log for them. And then coming up soon, we'll be providing more Bible study resources for you during this time. Uh, following the governor's orders, uh, all church activities are closed down through Monday, April 6th. Going forward, the session is going to make decisions week by week but we'll be making those decisions in time so they'll be posted on our website by 10 o'clock on Thursdays. We'll also send it out on the Liberty link that goes out Thursdays as well. So for example, by Thursday, April 2nd, we'll be posted what the status is for events that happen from April 6th through Easter Sunday and ongoing as orders change. Once everything gets back to normal, Things will not be back to normal. It is my dubious pleasure to inform you that as I was driving here, uh, there's a big sign on Home Road, and as part of the 315 Home Road intersection construction project, starting April 6th, the Home Road bridge will be closed for, wait for it, five months. So April 6th to August 30th, the Home Road bridge will be closed. So those of you who live east of the river, when things resume to normal, are going to need to plot a different route uh, to get to Liberty Church. Well, this is now the third Sunday we have gone without collecting offerings, and I want to share uh, some words from the session on this. Three points. Uh, first, the session realizes that some of your paychecks, some of your jobs are under threat during this time, and all of our investments have taken a serious hit. Uh, the session wants to encourage you to make wise financial decisions for yourself and for your family, as well as wise health decisions. Secondly, some of you give online or give by mailing in a check through the mail, and we thank you for already continuing to do that. For those of you who normally uh, give your offering by dropping it in the basket here on Sunday, uh, we encourage you to consider mailing in your offering uh, by check through the mail, either uh, weekly or bi-weekly or monthly. Uh, if you do do that, please put on the envelope, attention, Dana Meeker. Dana Meeker, so that your check goes right to our financial administrator. If you'd like to explore how to give online or through our text to give program, on the homepage of the website, on the upper uh, right-hand menu, if you click on give, and then on the drop-down menu, ways to give, and click on that, it will take you to a page that you can then click for instructions on how to give online or how to use our text to give program. But the most important thing the session wants to say is we really do believe that God has the whole world in his hands, even Liberty's finances. So we encourage you to make wise and faithful stewardship decisions during this time. Now let's open up our hearts to the gift of music. Thank you. 
Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death, and he saved me. Let my soul be at rest again, 
for the Lord has been so good to me. For he has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. I believe in you, so I said. I am deeply troubled, Lord. In my anxiety, I cried out to you. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I'll lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. I'll keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The Lord cares deeply when his loved ones die. Lord, I am your servant. Yes, I am your servant, born into your household. You have freed me from my chains. I'll offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the house of the Lord, in the heart of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. I now invite you to join in singing, Were You There? Now as the family of faith, let's join our hearts together as we turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, you've given us your spirit, which is a spirit of peace and not of fear. And yet there's so much in this world of which we are afraid, especially right now. 
Lord, we are afraid during this pandemic. We pray for our own health and the health of our loved ones. We pray for the health of our church family. Lord, we ask your special blessing and protection on all health workers as they serve in this dangerous and stressful time. We also ask for your protection on police officers and firefighters and all other frontline public servants. Lord, we pray you would protect this world that you created, this world that you love, this world you have committed yourself to. Lord, we're afraid in this time of economic stress. We pray for those who have been laid off or whose paychecks have been cut or whose businesses are threatened. Lord, we pray especially for the poor who always suffer first and most. Lord, we continue to pray for our government, uh, local, county, state, and national leaders. Lord, bless them as they make hard decisions. Guide them always in the paths of safety and justice. Lord, even as we face these fearsome things with unflinching eyes, fill us with your spirit of peace. Heal the fear and anxiety we experience all around us. And above all, Lord, when our world scares us, help us to trust you, for you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, and therefore we will not be afraid. Lord, this morning we especially lift up these members of our Liberty family. We pray for Tom and Bill, for John, the Lind family, the Spring family. And Lord, hear now our most private prayers, which we offer to you in silence. And we pray these things confidently in the name of the one who drives out all fear, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I invite you to open your heart to the gift of music.
I am not colorblind, uh, nor have I ever searched for anything on my computer about anything related to colorblindness, but my phone somehow, sometime, must have heard me say something about colorblindness because recently I began receiving advertisements for a product called Enchroma Glasses. Now these glasses offer some people affected with colorblindness the ability to perceive color in a way that their own eyes are unable to deliver. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you discover that the world around you doesn't look the way that you thought it did. Instead, the world is much more vibrant and colorful than you could possibly imagine. Imagine what it must be like to realize that while the world has been living in technicolor, you have been living in black and white. And then imagine that with one touch, simply by putting on a pair of glasses, you can see clearly for the first time. Well, on YouTube, you can find videos of people receiving their first pair of Enchroma glasses, seeing the world in all of its multicolored glory for the first time. And as you can imagine, people are pretty overwhelmed. In fact, reactions like this one aren't all that uncommon. Buddy, can you look at the... Kason, look out at the frisbees. Look at the frisbees. Can you see them? Can you see the differences? It's so amazing. They're so colorful. And it's kind of weird because I didn't, like... I've never seen those colors before, but I kind of knew what they were. That day changed my life. Well, in our scripture passage for this morning, Jesus heals a blind man. But this is perhaps one of the strangest healing stories in all of the Gospels because Jesus heals him twice. The first time, the man's sight is only partially restored, and it's only after Jesus touches him a second time that his blindness is completely healed. So let's listen now to God's word from Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 33. When Jesus and the disciples arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say you're one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view not from God's. Well, today is the fifth Sunday in Lent, 
Next Sunday, we'll celebrate Palm Sunday and welcome Jesus as our triumphant king while noting how quickly cries of Hosanna turn to cries of crucify him. And the week after, on Easter Sunday, we will celebrate that Jesus is alive, Lord, even over death. That the tomb is empty and that the true king of glory sits on a throne, but not of gold, but one of rough-hewn wood in the shape of a cross. And it seems like just yesterday we were here in this barn confessing all the ways that we have been blind to the presence and power of God in our own lives. And then with ashes in the shape of a cross on our forehead, we embarked on our Lenten journey together. A journey from spiritual blindness to seeing our world and our Lord with clear vision. But that Ash Wednesday is light years away from the Lent that we're living now, isn't it? Many of us take on the practice of fasting, of, of giving up something that's important to us as a Lenten discipline in order to focus us on our need for the presence of Jesus in our lives. But I don't think any of us expected to give up quite this much for Lent. So if you're anything like me, you found this Lent to be one of profound disorientation. In the past few weeks, I've had so many things taken away from me that I thought were crucially important, only to find out that they're not all that important at all. And things I've taken for granted in my life are now gone. And I realize how much I need them. Maybe you can relate. See, I, I came into Lent thinking that I could see pretty clearly that my spiritual vision just needed a bit of fine focus. Only find out that like the man in the story, I couldn't see clearly at all. Much like the boy in the video, before he put on the glasses, I thought I was seeing the world as it really is. And I didn't realize how distorted my vision actually was. But I wonder, could this Lent, in all of its challenges and strangeness, could it offer us a second touch encounter with Jesus? Could this Lent actually bring into sharp focus, could this Lent actually bring new insight into who Jesus is and how we are called to be his disciples, not in some fuzzy and abstract way, but in a clear, sharp, focused, concrete way? Now, what's interesting about our story for this morning is that it not only tells the story of a man whose eyes were open to see the reality of the world around him, but this passage also begins the story of the disciples gaining new sight into the reality of who Jesus is and the implications of who Jesus is for their own lives and for the whole world. After Jesus heals the blind man twice, Jesus asks the disciples who people say that he is. And after receiving a rundown of all the various popular opinions, Jesus then asks the disciples who they say he is. And Peter answers for the group that Jesus is the Messiah, the one God has sent into the world to demonstrate God's love and faithfulness the one God has sent into the world to pour out God's mercy and grace. The one God sent into the world to be clothed in human flesh so that we might be wrapped up in God's presence forever. And although Peter answers Jesus' question correctly, it is clear that he is still half blind to the truth about who Jesus is. Because as soon as Jesus begins to tell his disciples that his glory will be revealed as he is humiliated and rejected, that his grace will be revealed as he is condemned, that the weight of sin will be lifted as it crushes him, that the power of his life will be revealed as he succumbs to death and then rises again. As soon as Jesus explains to the disciples that we cannot know the full truth about who he is, 
until we join him on that journey to the cross and the empty tomb. Peter takes Jesus aside and tells him that he needs to cut this kind of crazy talk out. See, Peter can't imagine a God who loves him so much that he would be willing to give his own life to redeem Peter's. Peter can't see that God's glory is all the more radiant because Jesus willingly suffers and endures death on a cross so that the bright light of the resurrection might eliminate the shadow of death. Peter can't understand that real life is found only as we give up our lives to follow Jesus. And that when we follow Jesus, that means that we have to follow him all the way to the cross because we don't get to choose where Jesus takes us. And yet Jesus insists that following him to the cross and the empty tomb is the second touch that allows us to see him and ourselves and the whole world around us clearly as it truly is. In these two stories paired together, the story of the blind man healed twice and this exchange between Jesus and Peter, Jesus is telling us that if we want our spiritual sight to be completely restored, if we want our lives to be completely transformed by Jesus, then we're going to have to follow him all the way to the end of this story, all the way to the cross, all the way to the empty tomb. And because this journey with Jesus is a journey of transformation, we may find that it is accompanied with growth pains. At times it might be unpleasant. At times it may even be painful. But Jesus tells us that following him will mean denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and giving up our lives for Jesus. But this journey with Jesus is also a journey that is chock full of promise. Because just as Jesus finally gives fullness of sight to the blind man, Jesus can be counted on to finish the job of healing and redemption that he has begun in each one of us. So we, we enter into these final two weeks of Lent, journeying with Jesus to the cross and the empty tomb. I wonder if this year, as different as it is, we might be freed up both to admit our need for Jesus and our need to follow him more closely. I wonder if this year we might be freed up to join with the Palm Sunday crowds and to welcome Jesus as our long-awaited Savior and King, and then to obey him without reservation, even when it's not convenient. I wonder if this year, as we remember Jesus' last meal with his disciples, we might be more aware of how hungry we are for God's mercy and grace and then discover again how our lives might be filled by the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. And I wonder if filled with God's grace at the table, we might see new ways to be God's gracious presence in the world around us. I wonder if this year, as we stand at the foot of the cross on Good Friday, our eyes might be more keenly focused on the depth of our own brokenness, and the depth of God's love for us. And I wonder if we might see new ways to love others with the same self-sacrificial love that we receive from God in Jesus Christ. I wonder if this year, as we run with Peter to the empty tomb, if we might be aware of our own desire for new life, and our minds might be more open to the possibility of resurrection, both in our lives and in the life of the world around us. I wonder, as we continue on this Lenten journey together this year, I wonder whether we might be able to experience the second touch of Jesus so that we can see clearly, as if for the first time, 
the dazzling glory of his love, the healing power of his mercy, and the saving power of his grace. Friends, let's pray. Gracious God, it's hard for us to admit that we don't always see clearly. It's hard for us to admit that we need a second touch from you. That it's by following you wherever you lead us. To the cross and to the empty tomb. As we give up our lives for you. That is how you will open our eyes to the truth of how much you love us. To the truth how, of how generous you have been with us. To the truth of how much we need your grace. To the truth of how abundant the supply of grace is in you. Lord, give us grace to believe these things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. to thank our musicians and our sound crew for being here, for Jonathan White for being our sound engineer, for Olivia Judy and Sarah Whitehead, our vocalists, David Tolley and Gary Wasserman, Mark Schaffnett as our musicians, and Steve Banks for arranging all of our music and for putting this video together. And now as the bell rings to send us back out into the world, take this final moment to consider what has God said to me this morning? And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever.
God's grace and peace be with you.